Please welcome David Witt from the NSA in Beijing. And then to talk about uh, also the last estimation of dictionaries and dictionary uh, development dictionaries. Okay, so this work is kind of related to uh, the paper I submitted to NIPS, and after I submitted the paper, I started thinking about it a lot more, basically extended some of the ideas from the paper. So if you happen to check that out, um, this is based on that, and then pushing a little bit further. Um, some of this also extends to rank minimization, but I don't think I'll have time to talk about that today, but a lot of the techniques and ideas I've tried out for minimizing rank, and we can do some interesting things uh, there as well. Okay, so, um, and also, please interrupt anywhere if you, if you have a question. Um, this seems to be a pretty small gathering. Um, okay, so the basic problem I'm looking at is just sparse estimation. Probably most people are familiar with this. Uh, just a linear model, uh, n-dimensional ve vector of observations y, and you have a dictionary of basis vectors. I think sometimes I use the word dictionary um, just in a very generic sense. In compressive sensing, this could include the measurement matrix and the sparsity transform. Everything is lumped in there. Um, I'm just using it as just a generic matrix of basis vectors. Um, the key is that it's overcomplete, so there's many more columns than rows. And then you have uh, unknown coefficient vector x. You don't have to and obviously you can add noise to this model as well. It's just for simplicity now, I'm looking at the noise in this case. Okay, so the dimension of x, as I said, I, we assume is much greater than the dimension of y, so there's an infinite number of solutions, and so we, uh, we're looking for the maximum sparse solution. So most elements of x we'd like to be equal to zero, exactly equal to zero. So this is a combinatorial optimization problem. Um, minimizing the L0 norm, count of the non-zero elements. So uh, it's NP-hard, discontinuous, non-convex. So the most common thing people do in this situation is to find the closest convex approximation, which is minimizing the L1 norm. So uh, here we just replace the L0 with the L1 and try to solve that. And there's been a huge amount of research, as I'm sure all of you know, in the past 10 to 15 years, quantifying exactly what conditions guarantee that the L1 norm solution equals the L0 norm solution exactly. And just to summarize in a very hand-wavy fashion those results, basically if the dictionary phi is sufficiently unstructured, um, then L1 will succeed, otherwise it will fail. So uh, just to explain that a little more, what, what you mean by unstructured, um, basically, if, if you take the dictionary and you, and you look at every pairwise correlation between the lines of the dictionary, if most of the energy is along the diagonal, I, I'm saying that's unstructured. So there's not a lot of correlation. There's some because it's, it, the dictionary is overcomplete. So there's always going to be some correlation, but it's uh, as small as possible. So examples are if you have a, a unstructured dictionaries, or as if you just take uh, Gaussian IID elements and make a dictionary or if you randomly sample rows of a discrete Fourier transform. So if you do that, you get a big overcomplete dictionary, you take all these inner products, and most of the energy is on the diagonal. So the structured case is more general. Um, now you have lots of correlations in possibly an arbitrary structure. Um, so basically, if you pre or post multiply an unstructured dictionary by a matrix A, an arbitrary invertible matrix, or say something like a black diagonal matrix, you are adding correlations in the column of the dictionary. So this is what I'm calling the structured case. <coughs> so here's a block diagonal example just to kind of show how this can cause a problem for regular L1 minimization. Um, here you just take a, say, a Gaussian IID dictionary, <coughs> multiply it by a block diagonal matrix, and now when you look at these inner products, you have these big blocks of correlations along the diagonal. And what typically happens in this, these sorts of examples, if you want to solve for the maximum sparse solution, typically the L1 solution will select a, a zero, either zero or at most one basis vector from within each of these blocks. So it will, uh, from all these correlated basis vectors that form like a little cluster, it will pick one of them. Maybe it will pick the right one, maybe not, but it will usually pick one. And the cluster support might be mostly correct, meaning it will mostly pick 
uh, clusters that at least have one non-zero in it, but the chosen basis vectors within the cluster will typically be wrong. So this is uh, uh, just, I guess, symptomatic of a bigger problem. Like, it, this is what you want to solve. You want to find a maximally sparse solution, x naught. So you're replacing it with something tractable, the L1 norm minimization problem. And the problem really to guarantee that x1 equals x0 with arbitrarily structured dictionaries is that the only way that can be true is if the, the signal you're observing is equal to uh, or proportional to one of the dictionary columns, which is a trivial case. So, and the motivation, I guess, for this is um, that most theory, essentially all theory, applies to the unstructured case. But many, and maybe even most dictionaries, have some structure. So, um, for example, people have been doing recently face recognition where the basis vectors are uh, stacked images. Um, uh, a lot of people use image patches for classification. They form dictionaries. They learn basis functions that can be highly correlated. So there's many examples where the dictionaries have a lot of structure, possibly unknown structure. And these are the ones, the dictionaries people are using, but the theory applies to the unstructured case. And actually I would argue even in uh, compressive sensing, uh, many of the dictionaries are not actually unstructured because it, many hardware constraints mean that you cannot sample random IED Gaussians. For example, for MRI, it's very difficult to make your MRI machine exactly compute Gaussian points in space. So typically that's not done. So I, I, I would make the case that um, there's somewhat of a, a mismatch here in that the theory applies to unstructured case, but many people are actually using structured dictionaries. So one of the things that people have done to improve L1 minimization and is, is used, uh, for example, in MRI heavily, is reweighted L1. So this is a way of refining the L1 solution to uh, hopefully improve uh, the, the recovered signal. So the question I, I'm bringing, I raise here is, is reweighted L1 in its present form really addressing the problem with structured dictionary? So what reweighted re L1 minimization is, is you, you basically take an arbitrary concave penalty function, or it's a concave uh, non-decreasing function of the magnitudes. And this is a closer approximation to the L0 norm than the L1 norm. So possibly you can get sparser solutions that are closer to the L0 norm solution. So here's the, what a penalty function looks like, and obviously this is uh, closer to the L0 norm than the L1 norm because of this concavity. And the way it works is you just do these um, simple iterations and you're guaranteed to find a local minimum of this cost function. So the question is, are these iterations really helping dealing with structured dictionaries? And no, these iterations are really helping with solve a different problem. So I'll, I'll give a quick example of this. So here's um, the most common penalty function that people use for reweighted L1 minimization. And there's a parameter here you, you can choose. You can either set it with a continuation method or just pick a fixed value. And basically, the, the update rules become an L1 problem with some weights here. These weights start equal to 1, so the initial iteration is just the regular basis pursuit <coughs> solution. And then at each iteration, you compute the weights via this formula. And this formula is just based on a first order Taylor series approximation to this. So it's sort of just computing the gradient, basically, of this function. And you just iterate these until you get to a local minimum. But the problem is if the initial L1 iteration is bad because of dic dictionary structure, there's no compensation for dictionary structure in this weight update, and you will just be stuck. So like some simulations I try, if I use a structured dictionary with this update, basically the solution never changes from the regular L1 norm solution. It just gets stuck. What, what these updates really help with is dealing with learning magnitudes that are very different scales. So the regular L1 norm solution is invariant to coefficient magnitudes, basically. Whether or not you achieve the, the maximally sparse solution or not is only dependent on the sign pattern and the support. <coughs> But by using these updates, you can uh, actually, uh, there was a paper recently proving that you can get uh, uh, slightly tighter rounds, a, tight, a slightly better phase transition to recovering uh, the L0 norm. And it's basically because these iterations, if you have a few coefficients that are really large, 
this weight becomes zero. The next update, it's free to use those coefficients, and it, it, it's kind of like solving a smaller subproblem, and then later it can get the smaller magnitudes. So intuitively, this weight update only depends on the magnitudes, and it's only really designed to help deal with recovery problems that have small magnitudes. So, so the new strategy that I've been looking at is um, somehow getting to weight updates that depend on the dictionary. And one way to get weight updates that depend on the dictionary is using a dictionary dependent um, sparsity penalty. So the way I did it is there's already a lot of sparse penalties, but they're always applied directly on the coefficients x. So why not first project the coefficients to a new space that maybe has some better properties and then apply the standard sparsity penalties that have already been used. So here is just some abstract uh, projection, p of phi, and now we just apply the same sort of sparsity penalty, some g of z. Um, normally there would be the x here, but now it's the z, so it's very simple. And the key is that this projection, it has to somehow compensate for the dictionary structure. And the uh, very key property is that it has to preserve sparsity. So if the z is sparse, that must translate into the x being sparse. Otherwise, you haven't really accomplished anything. So this is the ideal scenario. You would like this to be true in all cases. Obviously, that's impossible. But um, this is the real the goal, is how close to this can we get. If you, if you start with some unstructured dictionary, and maybe you multiply by some sort of uh, structure introducing matrices A and B, and you get some phi structure, you would like some sort of correspondence such that if you're minimizing the sparsity penalty with respect to z in this projection, it somehow results in performance that's like minimizing this g with the original unstructured dictionary. Something like that. Obviously, you cannot do this in all cases. This is an NP hard problem overall, but um, perhaps there's, uh, in many situations, you can get this sort of correspondence. So um, the simple uh, pipeline for this method or recipe is just choose uh, some sparsity penalty function. Maybe there's some criteria that some are better than others. And also choose a dictionary dependent projection. And then compute the update rules and look for properties that are useful for uh, dealing with structured dictionaries. So I say, you, I showed before these reweighted L1 updates, but you can also do reweighted L2 updates. But I won't talk about that, but you can get uh, good results from that as well. So the one thing is that all of this can be done in what I call either a primal space or a dual space. So I use the, a slightly non-standard definition of these, but it's uh, useful for de developing different classes of these penalty functions. So. The, any sparsity penalty you can represent in this primal space, which is the most familiar uh, definition, but also a dual space. So the primal space just means you have the some function of x, and it's dependent on a concave non-decreasing function h of the magnitudes. That ensures that every local minima of the cost function will be a sparse solution. But any function that you express in this form, you can express as a minimization over these hyperparameters, gamma. And so these are like variational parameters or something like that. And if this h function is concave non-decreasing, then this h star function will be concave and non-decreasing. So you can actually derive uh, sparsity penalties in either space. You can either choose this function uh, and work out what g is, or you can just choose this h directly. And when it comes to applying these dictionary dependent projections, it makes a big difference whether you do it in this space or in this space. So I'll give some more examples of that. But the idea is, in the primal space, you would just take the regular sparsity penalty and put the projection uh, coefficients in there. But you could also do the same thing to this h star penalty, do a projection of the, these latent variables, and replace them, the projection z in here, and, and then create some uh, dual penalty. So you know, this one is less transparent, but the, the concepts are basically the same. And th this one, though, sometimes the performance isn't quite as good. So uh, I'll give one uh, quick example of this. So a candidate sparsity penalty is just the log of the magnitudes of x. You can also put a lambda regularizer in there if you want. And the dual here is, just looks like this. Usually the function here is not the same, but um, in this case it is. 
And so a, a candidate projection operator is the dictionary times the diagonal of the magnitudes of the x's times the dictionary transpose. So at first it might not be intuitive why this is a good projection operator, but I'll, I'll give, once I derive the update rules, I will try to motivate why this might be a good projection operator, especially when, when combined with a penalty like this. So here are the aggregate penalty functions you get when you, when you um, plug this projection operator in, in, into either here or into here. Um, for the primal space, which is a little uh, more transparent what's going on, uh, this is the function you get, the projection operator of these eigenvalues. So you're summing up the logs of the eigenvalues, which is equivalent, the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues, so you move it inside the log, and this is the penalty function you get. And this is like a, a measure of volume, so you, you can kind of see where this might be a sparsity penalty because the determinant is the um, volume of the parallelogram formed by the eigenvectors of, of this matrix here. So the way you minimize the volume is by collapsing individual dimensions as opposed to uh, reducing all dimensions equally. You, you, reduce, you can basically reduce the volume to zero if you do that. So you can kind of see how this is a, a sparsity penalty. It's also concave in the magnitudes of x. And you can do the same thing in the dual space. So now you get a similar sort of penalty function in the dual space. But there's no closed form solution for what this is, but you can still do all the minimization, all the reweighted L1 or reweighted L2 minimization in either space. And one interesting thing is that if, if, the, if the lambda goes to zero, which I, I just added this lambda regularizer, if the lambda goes to zero in either this penalty function or this penalty function, um, they both have the same minimum as the L0 norm. And if the lambda goes to infinity, they both converge to like a scaled version of the L1 norm. So they're pretty well motivated sparsity uh, penalties. But that, the real thing is, what, uh, what do the update rules look like? And do the update rules, when you do this reweighted L1 minimization, do they help you compensate for dictionary structure? And I believe they do. So here, the primal space penalty, which is the easiest one to analyze. Um, if you look at its iterations, the first one is just um, minimizing the L1 norm. So the first iteration just has weights equal to 1, and you saw the regular uh, basis for solution. So what's more interesting is once you have this solution, you, you plug it into the, um, into the <coughs> weight updates. So the weight updates are just obtained by taking the gradient of these two functions. So I'm doing the primal space one now. So if you take the gradient of the primal space function with respect to each of the magnitudes, this is the weight update you get. So what is this uh, actually doing? So inside here, this term is basically the, the eigenvalues of, of the, um, this comes from, it's the same as this, like that, the eigenvalues of that are where the sparsity penalty. And what, and what happens is that um, if you have two basis vectors that are correlated, their projection over this matrix are gonna be basically the same. So the weights, wi and maybe some other d d wj, are basically going to be the same if you have two correlated columns. And the question is, which ones will be big and which ones will be small? Because those will determine uh, which basis vectors are eliminated in the next round. So what happens is, if you, have, if you return to that uh, cluster dictionary, or when you multiply an unstructured dictionary by a block sparse matrix, you create all these clusters. So what happens is, if, if the clusters are active in here, the L1 norm solution will typically pick one basis vector inside of each cluster. And so the subspace of this will represent all of the active clusters. So the weights here will basically be the same if you're inside of an active cluster, and it will, they'll either be really small inside of an active cluster, or they'll be really big outside of an active cluster. So the first update will basically choose all of the appropriate clusters. And then later iterations will pin down the support inside that cluster. So just to say it in words, the initial iterations uh, locate appropriate groups of correlated basis vector vectors and uh, prune the irrelevant ones. And they, once the support is narrowed down, once you've chosen the appropriate substructure, then uh, later L1 iterations can uh, uh, narrow down the support further. So the reweighted L1 iterations naturally handle this 
uh, transition. And the dual space penalty uh, also does something similar, but it has some uh, additional theoretical properties which are useful. So um, just a quick notation to show some of the theoretical results tied to this idea. Um, this uh, psi of u and v is the set of sparse vectors x0 with some support pattern u and sign pattern v. So if x0 is this vector here, this psi of uv would just look like this. So it's just uh, quantifying or describing the support and the sign pattern. So here's just a, a first result when you use the dual penalty um, under some very mild conditions. Basically, these are conditions like uh, to prevent you from having a matrix with all, all ones, say. You're obviously not going to be able to find the sparse inverse. So the main condition is that every uh, m by m block of the matrix has to be in the middle. So the conditions are pretty mild. Then the reweighted L1 implementation of this dual uh, penalty, it will never do worse than the regular L1 norm solution. And for any dictionary, no matter how correlated the columns or whatever structure it has, and any sign support pattern, there will always be cases where it does better. And the, maybe the most interesting part is that this is not true of any possible projection-free reweighted L1 algorithm. So that minimizes a cost function of this form. So really this is saying if you want to compensate for the dictionary structure, you have to do, you have to do something like this. The standard penalty functions and reweighted L1 algorithms are not sufficient. So an alternative approach though is, I, before I started with penalty functions and then worked out what the update rules are and, and they seem plausible. But once, once you've done that, why not just develop the weight update rules uh, initially, just directly, and then try and learn what properties you have and can you improve performance any. So here's the basic reweighted L1 uh, optimization procedure. You solve weighted L1 steps and then you compute some weighting function. But this f, you can choose however you want. You don't need to start with a penalty function. You can just start with what you think is a plausible f, uh, perhaps to compensate for di dictionary structure. And you can, yeah, you can choose it without regard to a specific uh, penalty function. But if this f is a non-decreasing function, then there will always exist an associated sparsity penalty with that is being minimized. So what are like a general candidate that I've used kind of based on intuition and kind of to get some theoretical results to hold looks like this form. Um, again, you have this term in here where the magnitudes of x play a crucial role. They're basically choosing the subspace at, at each iteration, the sparsity pattern of this chooses the subspace of the, di the dictionary columns that are active that have uh, important properties for the sparse solution. And then there's an exponent here, p, and then there's another exponent, q, and then again you have the projections of each columns over this uh, matrix in the middle, and for some p and q bigger than zero. So the implicit penalty function from this you cannot write out in closed form, it's an integral that you can show. But for the right choice of p and q, you have some uh, guaranteed recovery results for structured dictionaries. So here's a, a clustered dictionary model. Again, I, I didn't design this penalty function for clustered dictionaries, but clustered dic dictionaries are easier to analyze. So um, this is just showing that this particular choice is very useful for dealing with structured, uh, a particular type of dictionary structure. So I define phi unstructured k to be any dictionary such that the L1 minimization succeeds for any sparse vector uh, with sparsity less than k. So then a structured version of this, uh, kind of uh, derived from this unstructured dictionary, is any dictionary where you take every column of this one and replace it by a little bouquet of um, clustered basis vectors. So you, you have some radius E, every column here, you now you add a bunch of columns that are within some radius and form a little bouquet, a cluster. And then finally, the cluster support is just which of these little clusters of bouquets have um, an, at least one non-zero basis vector or coefficient inside. So here's a, a quick result. If x0 is some sparse signal under mild conditions, reweighted L minimization using this weighting function I uh, proposed with, with uh, any uh, uh, cluster dictionary model will recover x as long as the cluster support is less than k 
and the sum of the number of basis vectors within each cluster is less than m, the signal dimension, the observation dimension. For, for p equals to q, uh, some q bigger than 1, and a lambda epsilon sufficiently small. What this is saying is that it's, we've significantly extended the class of, of, of um, dictionaries where you can provably recover the maximally sparse solution. This means within each of these bouquets, you're recovering the exact support of, of the non-zero elements. So regular L1 minimization can handle unstructured dictionaries. That's well known. And it can also handle dictionaries with a few clusters um, and uh, some structure. But if you do subsequent reweighted iterations with these dictionary independent penalties I'm discussing, then you can extend these results to many type clusters. And, and really, I've used uh, this method. I tried it out on a lot of different types of structured dictionaries. It works very well. It's just the clustered ones are somewhat easier to analyze. So the, but it's an open question what other structures you can provably uh, recover. So here's just a similar simulation example to show that, that this performance works. Um, you generate some sparse vector, generate a Gaussian IID dictionary, and then a block diagonal matrix with uniform um, elements that are four by four. So, so this is introducing correlations between groups of four columns. And then you compute two observation vectors one with the original unstructured dictionary, and one where you've included the B here. So now you have two observation vectors, Y unstructured and Y unstructured and Y structured. So you run all these different methods, and you try and estimate X naught with the two different observations. And ideally, the performance would be the same. Ideally, uh, it wouldn't matter which observations you have, because in practice, you don't have the choice of choosing between these two. Often one is just given to you. So, and then you can repeat, repeat with different uh, sparsity values. And with this projection method, basically the green and the blue, nothing changes. Like, the performance is basically identical. Um, this is the sparsity of the uh, vector you're recovering. This is the probability of success. If you use the Kenda's remaining weighting method, which is the most popular and it's very effective, the performance drastically degrades um, when you use the structured dictionary. And you also might ask, why is the, this method inferior even in the unstructured case? And I believe that this is because the, the dictionary size I use is pretty small. It's only 50 by 100, so there's still a lot of um, structure even in a random sample of a Gaussian at that size. It, if you increase the size of the dictionary uh, a lot further, this line will get closer to these two. Um, so uh, I think... Sorry? Yeah, so I'll just, I'll skip a couple of things. And I'll just summarize them since I, yeah, we're different. Um, so the, the, the main point here is that in practical situations, really dictionaries are highly structured. It's almost an idealized scenario where you get to use a dictionary that's purely random and purely unstructured. But uh, essentially, most of the standard sparse estimation algorithms are really inadequate. They're not designed to handle this situation. And so we're, we've suggested a general framework to help compensate for this with dictionary-dependent sparsity penalties. And really, it could lead to a whole new family of sparse estimation algorithms. So in quick uh, future directions, what is the best penalty function and projection operator? These are just ones I've experimented with, and, uh, but there could certainly be better ones. And can you also take any of these projection operators and swap them into existing sparse uh, algorithms and improve them for the structured dictionary case. Maybe there's some very fast algorithms that you could design in, in this genre. And then also uh, at this NIPS there was two papers also developing uh, interesting algorithms for basically addressing the same problem um, with uh, sparse estimation with structured <coughs> dictionaries or correlated dictionaries. So there could be some interesting uh, connections between this work, I think. So here. Uh, that's it. So some questions for David? Good. Good. Let's start with the uh, Arthur over there. Um, so it's kind of like, it's all, my question is, how, how much worse is it to do essentially just one step of your algorithm in the structure? So, if you're so one step is very good. 
So you just what? take it to the blocks and then pick the best one within the block, right? Well, right. So, so but for the block sparse case is like an idealized scenario, right? So for the block sparse case, one iteration is pretty good. Um, but for other things I've used it on, you, you need further iterations. But the reweighted L1 converges quick, very quickly. So the most iterations I ever run is on the order of five, five or ten. After that, most of the time it just gets any, all of the reweighted one algorithms converge very quickly. So there, there's diminishing marginal returns beyond ten iterations for sure. But, but I've tried it on different sorts of structured dictionaries where it, it, you definitely need to run at least a few iterations before converging. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was wondering whether you have any uh, principal way of setting the parameter like that. Uh, you, you, you can just set it to zero if you want. But, um, but in practice, what do you do? In practice, I just pick a small value. But with some decreasing positions? You could. I, I normally just keep it fixed. But you could. Um, that's a, a useful question. I mean, the lambda has something to say about at what level of correlated basis vectors you want to have the same weight. So the bigger you make the lambda, the more correlated uh, vectors will lead to correlated weights in the, new, in the update rules. So it, it's kind of like related to that. You can see like the subspace of these active clusters will, and, and, and how big it expands out of that to nearby basis vectors will depend on that lambda. So, but for, for a lot of things, I just set it to a small value. Yeah. So, last question for David. Thank you.